got your copy of God's Word, we will be in 2 Timothy chapter 2 for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and this is just to get us kind of dialed in as we're going to look at uh, part 2 tonight of how to study the Bible. Last week, uh, just while you're finding your place there, uh, we covered some preliminary stuff. We talked about the importance of observation, um, uh, um, observation, interpretation, and, and application, and, and kind of some preliminary stuff and how important context is, and really how important it is to study the Bible, and that uh, you need to know how to study. And, uh, and this is something that can really propel you to the, to the next level, if you will, of your, of your walk with the Lord is, is really knowing how to study. And, um, and it's important that we follow right steps to study because otherwise we're going to see tonight you can just go off anywhere. So Second Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 15, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, enter into a time of looking at how to study your word, help us to uh, be locked into uh, what you would have us to get out of this. Help us to have a desire to study. Help us to have a desire to, to dig in deeper into your word and uh, learn it and apply it to our lives. May you be honored and glorified uh, here in, in the remaining part of our service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're working at part two tonight, how to study the Bible. So, why are there rules of Bible study? We're going to look at that. Why are there rules of Bible study? There are rules of Bible study you must, uh, that you must follow. And, and if you don't follow these rules of Bible study, you can get off into wrong doctrine. You can do things that uh, the Bible doesn't intend for you to do. Just like when in a sport you have uh, rules. And, and everybody's been watching football lately, whether you're a fan of the college level or even if you're not a fan at all, you hear people talk about there are rules in a game and that rules in a football game is so that game is played with its true intent in mind. Just like athletes in games, you have to read the rules first. There are laws of government. One law of government is you don't pay taxes, you go to jail. Uh, there's laws of our state. You don't follow speed limits. You get speeding tickets, etc. If you don't follow the rules, uh, if you get pulled over on Highway 65 uh, going 80 miles an hour, you will get a ticket. And if you're high enough on the speed limit, they can actually take you to jail. If you're like, I think it's a 16, 17 over, something like that. And this is important. And these are these are very sobering things because, as you see on the quote behind me. The Bible is not a newspaper or magazine, so our approach cannot be secular or worldly. That's why I talked about last week a little bit about having a faith-based approach and that we have to be convinced, we have to have faith that when we open our Bible that we have the words, the very words God wants us to have. So which brings us now to the rules. Before you ask what a verse means, you must determine the context. Why is this important? Because all false teaching that's out there comes from a truth that's misplaced. Every book, every chapter, every verse has a doctrinal context. When you cut a verse in half and take it out of context, you can make that verse say whatever you want it to. Uh, you can uh, you start to cut up the Bible, you can make it say anything. You can take a little piece and bit from over somewhere else and, and, and because it's in the Bible, because it all fits, and we're going to talk about this on Sunday nights down the road, about the canonization of Scripture and how it's all in there. So somebody thinks they can take a little bit from Deuteronomy and take a, just a half of a verse from somewhere in the New Testament and put it together and we can make it say things uh, that it didn't mean to say when we don't understand right divisions, and we're going to talk about that later, and when we just have a, a, an agenda to just preach what we want to preach. And, and I've, I've talked to preachers about this, about how uh, often, if we're not careful, uh, if you teach topically, it's very easy to get off and say what you want to say and just try to make the Bible back up how you feel about something versus we're looking at the Word and we're trying to extract truth from that. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 tells us in account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved Brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, 
as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which uh, they that are unlearned and un unstable rest, as uh, they do also the other scriptures unto your own destruction. So he's, he's talking there about getting the full context. Joel chapter 2 and verse 1 So Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, which says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. It's important to understand the doctrinal context of things. James chapter uh, 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of... Um, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the twelve tribes scattered abroad greeting. So you see how there's importance of context. And Joel is talking about blowing a trumpet, making an announcement because the day of the Lord is close. So that helps set context for that chapter. And in James, a lot of people will try to say that James teaches works-based salvation. He doesn't because when you look at verse 1, here's who he is writing to. He's writing to believers. He's writing to saved Jews. That's why he's saying some of the things he's saying. He's not writing this with an evangelistic appeal. Now, there are some verses that definitely can help with that, but primarily the focus of this is to believers. Matthew 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So he's talking here about Believers, And then Psalm 23 and verse number 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Now, we can, a lot of people, now here's what's tragic. I'm not trying to be critical, but I want you to think about this for a second. I have went to funerals where the 23rd Psalm gets read. And boy, verse 2 sounds really good, doesn't it? Makes me lie down in green pastures. And it is good. But I've heard that read at a, at, a, at, a, uh, at a service. And I'm not saying I know the person's heart, but I know the family members told me that the person was not saved. Once again, context. Verse, 20, verse Chapter 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A, a saved person can't find comfort in this. Or excuse me, and a lost person can't find comfort in verse 2. But if you're saved tonight, if the Lord is your shepherd, then you can find comfort in verse number 2. So you see how important context is? I could take this verse, chapter, chapter and verse here, and I could go take this and, and try to make somebody feel good that isn't part of the family of God, that isn't one of God's children. I could do that, but that'd be a bad application of the text. And I'm not trying to be mean or ugly when I say this. I'm just trying to get a point here that I know there's some well-meaning people that may have done that, but my, my point is we can't do anything about that, but what are we going to do in 2024 at Mount Zion Baptist Church? Because I'm going to do a better job this year of returning to our theme, which is I will follow. And part of us following means we have to study. And if you think I'm smart, I'm not. I study, but it ain't because I'm smart. It's because I've made enough mistakes. It's because I've listened to people correct me a little bit. But I'm not smart. I'm just hard-headed don't know when to give up sometimes. So, Before you ask what a verse means, determine the context. How do I figure out the context? I wasn't there. How am I going to figure this out? How do we know what this says? Because we weren't there. You ever wondered that? You ever wondered how, you ever listened to some preachers talk about something and they have so much insight. They're able to, the way they talk about it, they could draw a picture of what happened there. And you think, wow, this, you, you think the guy was there. Well, it's because they studied really good. And if you study really good, and if you really try to break down words and you define words, and it takes a little bit of that word we sometimes don't like, 
It's a four-letter word. It's not a cuss word. Uh, some of us might think this. It's called work. And if we work, we can visualize what happened in Scripture. So how do we do this? We ask the question, what does this passage mean? So the task of asking what a passage means is called exegesis. And, and it's kind of a weird word, but I've always, it's, it's, I've always told myself to, to try to understand it and its definition. Exegesis. So I'm trying to see how Jesus is exhibited. How is Jesus pictured here? So you know what the opposite is? It's called eisegesis. And you may say, well, how do, how do you keep that definition? Well, it's, it sounds like isolate. I'm isolating Jesus out of things. Or I'm isolating the meaning, true meaning out of this text. And I'm just looking at this little part and I'm defining it the way I want to define it. Because you look up certain words that have multiple definitions. So sometimes this is where it takes a little bit of work. You have to read a chapter sometimes to see how, how how's a de- definition of a word determined. It's by its use. If I just say bus, do you know what I'm talking about? Not really. We've got a city bus. I could be talking about that. I could be talking about a school bus. I could be talking about a Greyhound bus. Do you know inside of computers there's something called a bus that distributes information inside of a computer? So if I just say bus and I don't give you, I don't, I don't use it, 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 it. It's using a term without definition. Voltaire, which he's not always quotable for us, but Voltaire said, if you wish to converse with me, define your terms. So at the exegeta passage, it simply means to carefully study a text very carefully, very rationally, and thoroughly to find the original intended, intended meaning, excuse me. The opposite is to draw into or read into. We are to do this without preconceived ideas and agendas. A VHS tape doesn't exist of what happened. I, I wish there was a VHS tape I could just put in and it shows creation. It shows the uh, children of Israel going out. I wish there was a VHS tape. I wish somebody was out there with a camera with, with the water parted. And where the children of Israel walked out on dry ground. I, I just read that the other day and I thought, man, that would be something if there was some way to see that. You know, maybe when we get to heaven, there's, there's some way where God allow us to see these things. I don't know. But that would be neat. But we don't have that. So the key is almost every time you find a doctrinal application of a verse is going to be at the beginning of the chapter. So that's why I read James earlier. I just didn't read that to, just to throw out verses. I read that to show you there was a purpose James had when he was writing. He was writing to save the Jews that were scattered abroad. They weren't right in one location, so he writes this letter to help them out. Help them know what their conduct needs to be. Help them to see what kind of fruit there needs to be in their lives. You'll find the context of a book at the beginning of the chapter, like James written to the twelve tribes, the Jews. This helps us to find the original audience, which helps us find the intended purpose. You ever heard the phrase, if you've taken speech class at all, know your audience, right? We've Sometimes in Scripture, we have to know that audience in Scripture for us to draw out what, we, what God wants us to have. So when we look at the rules of, of Scripture, we need to re- re- remember that with the audience, the audience is made up of three different people. So at any given time, when you're looking at the Bible, there's three audiences to consider. First one's the Jews. Second's the Gentiles. And the third one's the church. This helps us consider the audience at the time of the original writing. Not only do you have to determine the context, but you have to determine who is being spoken to, which, by the way, helps determine the context. God sees saved people, lost people, and when He looks at the lost... He sees Jews, Gentiles, and the church. So we need to understand that the Bible has proper divisions, and we must put those divisions in the right place. 2 Timothy 2.15. So the one part of that verse says, Rightly dividing the word of truth. God's Word says, hey, there's divisions here for you to learn. There are divisions to see when you study. 
And where do we fall into this? Well, we have a, it's a duty. It's a command for every Christian. No one can do your Bible study for you. Do you know that? It's good to come to church. It's great to be in Sunday school. It's, it's great to be in a morning service. It's great to be on a Wednesday night listening to principles about this and, and trying to help learn some, some things that can help you get into your Bible and enjoy it more. But at the end of the day, no one can do your Bible study for you. That would be like uh, a husband expecting somebody else to maintain the relationship with him and his wife. That's just not going to work, is it? It's not how it's going to be done. You have to have the work in a relationship and a marriage. Uh, with, with a friendship, you can't depend on another friend to help your relationship with another friend. It, it can't be that way. It doesn't work. There's a design that we must remember. The goal is to be approved by God, not by the lost, the scholarly community, or even by other believers who may view their Bible skeptically and critically. Remember, this verse here, this ought to be an encouragement. Study to show thyself approved unto God. I, I don't want to endorse being arrogant, but when you go out and you invite people to church, you try to talk to people about the Lord, you need to remember, you don't have anything to prove. If anything, it's, it's them that have something to prove. Because people will say, well, tell me, tell me why I should believe. How do you know there's a God? How do we know that there isn't a God? I think it's time for, for that crowd to sweat a little bit. Because this crowd's been sweating way too long. It's time for them to explain, well, how, how is your life better believing there's no God? Well, I can do whatever I want. Really? I don't think so. So remember, the design is for you to be approved. And you can be approved by God. doesn't mean that you have to muster up a bunch of effort. But if you're, if, you're, if you're really desiring to find the intended meaning, and you're desiring to find the intended audience, and you're trying to see what is there that you want me to have, Lord, if you come with a humble attitude to your Bible, God will show you something. But you've got to have the right attitude. My grandpa told me one time I was, I was struggling with my attitude, like most kids do. I, I must have been 11 or 12 at the time, and... And he said, you know, he said, your attitude's not great. I didn't like my grandpa telling me that. He said, your attitude's not great. And, and then he told me for a long time after that, attitude is everything. You don't need a degree from a Bible college or seminary, but you do need the right attitude. And the right attitude is going to help you get more out of your Bible. Diligence. That's something else we have to remember when we're determining things. Diligence. It takes exertion. Because it is work. It requires expertise. Because you must develop skill. One of the things we're going to look at. Um, I don't know why this is not working. All of a sudden this thing decided to quit on me. Yeah, if you want to move the slide for me. So attitude determines everything. And uh, you'd be surprised what an attitude would do with your Bible. One of the things, we're, or a couple of things we're going to look at is, uh, is how to use a Strong's Concordance down the road. Does anybody know what a Strong's Concordance is? Strong's Concordance. Basically, you can take words out of your Bible and you look it up and you see the Hebrew or Greek word, how it looks, and, and, and we'll show that. So, uh, And then we'll also see, too, I always suggest, because it's a, one of the older dictionaries, a Webster's 1828 dictionary is something I recommend to use for, for if you're going to study the Bible with. So to show yourself approved unto God a workman, you've got to work it yourself. You have to work at rightly dividing the word of truth. Everybody understands there's an Old Testament, a New Testament, a division where they uh, where they will say that all the, yet they will say all the Bible is written to Christians and there's no divisions. Make sure you know or make sure you put your divisions in the right place. Let's go to the next slide. So the Bible unfolds in seven dispensations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these tonight. Um, maybe we'll come back uh, next week and go over these. But uh, there's seven dispensations. And a dispensation is 
Um, it's a Bible idea based on stewardship, which is management of another person's resources over time. Uh, Luke chapter 16. And verses 1 through 4 tell us, And he said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man uh, which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear of, of, the, of the given account of thy stewardship? For thou mayest be no longer a steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig. Or I cannot, yeah, I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed, I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of stewardship they may receive me into their houses. So this guy didn't own anything, but he was doing something on behalf of somebody else. So the leading steward is called, there's a responsibility given to him to be carried out by his descendants. A failure to fulfill the stewardship is recorded and the steward is judged by being removed from the stewardship. Let's go on the next slide please. Dispensation is how God dispenses grace, eternal life, according to different uh, uh, terms and different ages. Um, let's go to the next slide because I want to see what we have next. Okay, uh, we're going to stop here for, uh, for tonight actually.